and you give it back to him. Now, I, I know that people in the world who do not follow Christ, they struggle with integrating their careers and their calling together. People who aren't in the kingdom, who don't follow Christ, they, they believe that their career and their calling is the same. And in many ways it is because their career and, the calling, and their calling exist to make the world a better place, right? So if they're in business, they're trying to make the world a better place. If they're in sales, they're providing deliverables that are trying to make the world a better place. If they're uh, in the health care community, they're serving people, caring for people, trying to make the world a better place. But here's the unique distinctive. When you become a Christian, your calling now moves you from just seeking to make the world a better place to seeking to make the kingdom a better place. Now you're not just doing something of earthly significance. Now you're doing something of spiritual significance. Oh, I I hope you get this. So if you're in business as a Christian, you're not now in business just to make the world a better place, but to make the kingdom of God a better place. If you're in marketing and branding, you're not just doing that social media to make the world a better place, but to make the kingdom a better place. If you're in health care, if you're a teacher in a public school classroom, you're not just doing that to make the world a better place, but to make the kingdom a better place. I'll never forget the, the teacher of an elementary school coming up to me at Joplin Family Worship Center where we pastored and saying to me, Pastor, um, I, I'm teaching in the classroom all week long. I'm teaching kids to read and write. I'm just so tired by the weekend that I, just so weary that I, I just, I don't want to serve in the church. I don't, I, I'm with kids all week. Why would I want to give and be with kids on the weekend? I'm with kids all week. So very, I tried to be very sweet and very humble. And I said, I said, okay, sis, so what you're telling me is that you want to be in the classroom all week long and make the world a better place, but you don't want to give your gift back to God to make the kingdom a better place. She said, let me pray about it. And she went home, and the next week she came up to me after service, and she said, Pastor, you're right. I don't want to just give my gift to the world. I want to give my gift to the kingdom. Are you getting this? It, it, it doesn't matter what your gift is. God's given that gift to you. He's given that ability to you. He's, he's blessed you with it. Now his expectation is that you'll turn around and you'll take the ability and the gifts that he's given to you and you'll honor those gifts by giving them back to him. And that may or may not be serving necessarily within the walls of the church house. That may be in the marketplace as well, giving your gifts to God in the marketplace. Did you know that only 3% of Christians in the world are going to receive any kind of financial remuneration through the church. That means 97% of all Christians are going to work in the marketplace, provide for their families in the marketplace, and make an impact in the marketplace. And I'm glad about it. Can you imagine how difficult it would be to reach the world if that 97% was working for the church and not in the marketplace? So God steps up and he says, you know what, here's the best plan of all. I'm going to send 97% of the people into every sector of every part of our society so that the cross can be marched right through the main street of your cities and towns and you can touch people with your calling. 
Jesus was marched through the main streets of Jerusalem, headed on the way to the cross. The cross went right through Main Street and was lifted up in the midst of his community. How much more today do we need to see the cross right in the middle of every part of Main Street and every health institution and school institution and theater and entertainment industry? The cross has to be lifted up in the marketplace. And it happens when we honor our calling. Turn to your neighbor and just say to them, honor your calling. Now tell them, take your ability and your availability and give it back to God. Are you ready to keep on going? Oh, we're, we're verse 1. We're still in verse 1. Are you getting something today? And here's how we do it. I'm, and I'm going to fly through these six verses. With all lowliness. That means humility of mind. That's why you don't stand up and say, guess what my gift is? You give your gift with lowliness, with humility, with gentleness. Gentleness there in the Greek means clemency, pardon. In other words, you're there to be so gentle that you pardon anyone who would offend you or hurt you with long, long suffering. You want to know what long suffering means? Long. You're patient in the midst of provocation. Bearing with one another in love, bearing up. I love the word bearing in the Greek because it literally speaks of sitting on the chair that you're sitting on right now. Bearing up, holding up one another. That's why being a part of a community of faith is so important and not just watching from afar. Because you can't bear up one another on your phone. You have to be present in person, bearing up one another in love, endeavoring to keep, endeavoring, making haste speedily, not wasting time, not letting grass grow under your feet, endeavoring to keep or preserve. You're protecting the unity of the Spirit, capital S, unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace, all wrapped up in peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all. That's his position. Nothing is above him. Who is above all and who is through all. That's his providence. There is no crevice or cranny or nook that God does not abide in. He's through all, and he is in you all. That's his presence. Right there we have his position, his providence, and his presence wrapped up in one, one phrase. Now we get to the good part. Write down in your notes, not only honor your calling, but honor the gift. Verse 7 but to each, those of you who are taking notes, write that down. Those are not, write that down. But to each one of us, grace was given. Do you know you have grace? Men, can I tell you, you have grace? I, I know your wife may say otherwise, but you have grace. Women, you have grace. Every one of us, who are Christ's followers, have been given. But watch this. It's according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, your grace is dependent upon the measure, or the Greek word here is metron. Sound familiar? It's where we get the word meter. So your grace is metered 
or measured according to Christ's gift. So what is Christ's gift? It's not Christ. Christ is not the gift here. Christ is the one who is giving the gift, right? Because as we read on down, it says, Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave. So really, the gift is not just singular. Are you following me? The gift is plural. Christ gave gifts in the form of a gift to us. Now we have parentheses. Now this, verse 9, he ascended. What does it mean that he ascended? Uh, First descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same also who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. What in the world? Some of you English uh, people, what do parentheses do? When you have parentheses in a paragraph, what does that mean? It highlights or it explains what was just said, right? So verse 9 and 10 is explaining what he just said in verse 7 and 8. In fact, if if you just want to highlight your, your scripture real quick, highlight it there because it says that get my reading glasses it says that he ascended on high and he led captivity captive verse 8 now verse 9 and 10 explains that now this he ascended what is it that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth and led captive it explains what was just stated Now, the rest of that verse says, and gave gifts of men, or to men. That phrase is explained after the parentheses. And he gave gifts to men, after two verses of parentheses. And he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, Pastors, maybe I can explain it this way. Jamie, step up here with me. I'm going to have you to represent Grace. I should have Cindy, but I'm... Or Karen, that's their name. (laughs) So we have Grace. Did you know everything that you receive from God flows out of Grace? Come here, Garrett. Just stand right over here. Garrett, move a little bit this way. Garrett represents blessing. So you are saved by, healed by, delivered by, anointed by, appointed by, sanctified by. Are you getting the picture? So our blessing is dependent upon the measure of grace overflowing and increasing in our lives. But here's the important part of it. The measure of grace we have is metered out or measured out, metron there in the Greek, according to the measure of of Christ's gift. Who is Christ's gift? So, God comes along and he gives the five-fold ministry gift as a plurality of gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, And the word of God literally says that our blessing is dependent upon the increased grace that exists in our life that is measured by how we honor the 
somebody grab a hold of it because how we honor the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, how we honor that gift determines how much grace is measured out in our lives which increases our ability for salvation, healing, deliverance, provision, protection, all of the blessings that God gives to us. So when we're honoring the gift, we're honoring the Lord, and we're opening up the blessing of God in our lives. People will say, well, why do I need a a pastor? I don't need a pastor. Well, then why would God give the gift of a pastor if you don't need a pastor? Why would, you, why would you need the gift of the apostle or the prophet if you don't need that gift in the church? We need that gift in the church. Because as we read on, it says they're given to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the measure of the stature of the perfection of Christ. We're being perfected in our faith, equipped for ministry because we have a gift in plurality given to us by God that measures and increases our grace to be blessed by God. Can we give him a praise right now? Thank you. Where where are we going to receive that type of a of, of blessing in ministry? Is the world going to provide that? Is the government going to going to help you grow in your faith? Are schools and in entertainment industries going to help you grow in your faith? Absolutely not. God gave the gift of his son to the world, but God gave the gift of the fivefold ministry to the church because they became representatives or become representatives of God's presence revealed through the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Honestly, we, we could preach and teach a long time on each of these five gifts, but can I just give you a quick snapshot? Do you, do you have time? Number one, the apostle. The the apostle is critical in in the the senses of the body, if you will. It's really the the sense of hearing. Do you know how our bodies have hearing, seeing, smelling, uh, touching, tasting? The five senses, right? The fivefold ministry becomes the five senses of the body of Christ. Now, our culture will say that if we're lacking one of those senses, they categorize us as disabled. Now, we know that you can accomplish great things without one of the senses in your body. You can have four of the senses, and and you can live wonderfully in life But the idea is that to have optimum functionality, five senses are established in your body for optimum functionality. How many know for optimum functionality in the body of Christ, we need all five senses? The apostolic is the hearing sense. Whenever God begins to do something in the church, capital C, capital C, global church, around the world, he'll start speaking to the apostolic gift. Not that he doesn't speak to every person. Not that he won't speak to you. But when it comes to what he's doing universally, globally in the kingdom of God, he shows up and he speaks to the apostles and the prophets because they have a platform a global platform to begin to go and say, thus saith the Lord all over the world. In the New Testament, the the apostles acted like missionaries. They would go on missionary trips and establish churches and plant churches and say, thus saith the Lord. I could even make a case for you today that hearing in the Bible supersedes seeing in the Bible. Because in the Bible, you don't read who hath eyes to see. Let him see. You hear who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
because your relationship with God really revolves around your ability to hear from God. The Holy Spirit living down on the inside. Do you not know that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Living on the inside, speaking to you as the priesthood of all believers. Speaking. So hearing is so critical and valuable in your life. I said it, I'll say it again earlier on. How can you do the will of God if you can't hear the voice of God? The apostle is that gift to the church that hears from God, speaks to God, globally touches the church on the hand. The apostle is the thumb because he or she connects all the other parts of the hand, all the other fivefold ministry gifts together. I would not call myself an apostle, so I would not walk in here and say, I'm Apostle Wayman Ming, but I function as an apostolic gift to the church around the world for the Pentecostal Church of God. Did you know that you're worshiping with 72 other nations where the presence of the Pentecostal Church of God is located around the globe? You're not alone. You have 72 nations where PCAG churches are believing God and marching to the mission of God's church just like you are. And apostles are needed to be able to connect the dots and the parts of the body of Christ so those 72 nations can function together and integrate together to make a kingdom impact for our day. Prophet, there's a lot of overlap between the apostolic and the prophetic. In the Old Testament, the prophets were called seers. Seers. Because they would see what God is wanting to do. Ezekiel saying the wheel within the wheel. Prophets would then point the way. So it's, the, it, it's the index finger, the pointer finger on the hand. The apostle and the prophet are, are together. They, there's a lot of overlap that functions together. But prophets in the body of, of Christ will focus you in a direction and say, see this, see that, see over here. God is wanting to point this out to you. Without vision, the people perish. So the prophetic unction, unction comes along and points the way so we can see the vision that God wants us to see to make the difference that he wants us to make. I'm moving quickly, evangelist. Evangelist is, is the smelling you got hearing, you got seeing, you got smelling. Evangelists just smell out people who need to come to Christ. Go into the highways and byways and it's the index finger, the longest finger on the hand because it reaches out further than any finger on the hand. It's the one that challenges us to reach out further than we've reached before. The evangelist is the one who smells, the, the pastor the pastor is the touching ministry gift in the kingdom of God. It's the caring, the shepherd that cares for the sheep. It's the ring finger on the hand because the, the pastor is married to the flock of God. And the pastor is the, the personal touch gift that comes to the body of Christ that's so important in the body of Christ. You, you would not necessarily want uh, an apostle to be the pastor of the church here because the apostle would constant be lo constantly be looking outside of this community and this, this body of Christ. We would be looking to the world and wanting to connect the world together and wanting to, to do something all over the globe. But the pastor centers the flock smells the flock and the sm flock smells the pastor. There's a, there's a, a touchy-feely thing that, that happens where the pastor is caring for the flock, married to the flock. Is anybody getting this? Teacher, the teacher is the taste. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and the teacher comes along and teaches precept upon precept, line upon line, helps us to stay balanced because the pinky finger is what balances the hand, balances the body of Christ to make sure that the body of Christ is taught with balance, teaching gift. And God says, listen, 
the grace and the blessing in your life is dependent upon the measuring or the meeting out of the fivefold ministry gift of the church. All right, let's bring it to the close. Last thought, write it down. Honor the Holy Ghost. Verse 30 of Ephesians 4. And do not grieve. Do not sadden the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Can I just remind you that the Holy Spirit is not a power you use, but a person you know. He's not just a force that was contemporized by the Star Wars trilogy. He's not just a force, he's a friend. And he's not just a presence, he's a person that walks in you and with you every moment of every day. He's a person. People think I'm crazy sometimes because I'm walking through Walmart or someplace and I'm talking to the Holy Spirit and they think I'm talking to myself. But I'm talking to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I just want you to know today that this is an area that I need your strength and support in. I, I need you to help me here. Holy Spirit, thank you for the joy of my salvation. Holy Spirit, thank you for blessing me and giving me peace. And he's a person. And you say, well, how do, how do you know he's a, he's a person and not just a presence? Well, let me show you a few scriptures. Let's look at Romans 8, 27. Now he, Christ, who searches the heart, knows the mind Did you know the Holy Spirit has a mind? He he has a mind. He has thoughts, just like we have thoughts. Acts 16, 6, Paul and his companions were forbidden to preach the word in Asia by the Holy Spirit. They were forbidden, which means he not only has a mind, but he has a will. What separates us from the chair that we're sitting on this morning? Someone might say, well, life. But, but trees have life. It's not just life. What separates you from the chair you're sitting on is You have a mind with thoughts, a will with desires, and emotions and feelings. That's what makes you a person. You have a soul with a mind, will, and emotions. The Holy Spirit has a mind. He has a will and desires. And right here in Ephesians 4.30, it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, which means the Holy Spirit has emotions and feelings. And if you read the verses leading up to it, it shows all of the things that grieve him. My, my wife, Kimberly, she's a words of affirmation a person. That's her love language. It's words of affirmation. And, and so if I happen to say something to her that hurts her feelings, it's a double whammy because she wants to be affirmed. And if I say something that's hurtful, it not only doesn't affirm her, but it hurts her. Guess what happens? She'll withdraw herself from me for a time because she's hurt, she's grieved, by what I said or what I did. Do you know the Holy Spirit is like that in your life? 
when you offend him or you grieve him by something you say or something you do, he withdraws from you. He doesn't draw near to you. He draws away from you because he feels dishonored and not honored. Some people will say, well, does that mean you're not, you're not going to heaven when you grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, the rest of the verse says that's not necessarily the case because it says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit for whom we were sealed, preserved until the day of redemption. In other words, just like a marriage relationship with your spouse, you may grieve your spouse who may withdraw sometimes the Holy Spirit may withdraw some, but that doesn't mean you can't bring reconciliation and be preserved until the day of redemption. Now, if you habitually sin and walk away from God, that's another story. But if you're just grieving the Holy Spirit, you can reconcile and there will be a reconciliation with him. That's why you feel guilty sometimes convicted sometimes you sense the grieving of the Holy Spirit in your heart and you have to say Lord Jesus Holy Spirit forgive me for grieving you how do we honor the Lord we honor him by honoring our calling by honoring the gift and by honoring the Holy Spirit stand with me today Jesus, Jesus, Holy Ghost, can we respond to the word today? I, I know that the challenge that's always before us is not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. That we understand that we don't come to Jesus by works. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. My hope is that during the message when we prayed that prayer, there was a, a mercy and hope that flowed, that saved your soul, that felt a conversion, a born-again moment. We can't save ourselves with works or what we've done. That's why we didn't focus on that a few minutes ago. But then when we become Christians, a transition happens. And we recognize that we're supposed to honor our calling, that save people, serve people. And I hope that you walk out of here today with an understanding of what your calling is. And that's simply whatever God's given you as a gift, as, as ability, that you give it back to Him. And we're going to start there this morning. And I want to ask you in your own words, if you would, just to bow your heads right now and pray and say, Lord, I want to honor you just in your own way. I want to honor you with my calling. And whatever you feel like your gifts are, I want you to speak them out right now to the Lord. I don't have to tell you what they are. You know what they are. They're coming to your mind right now. Thank you, Lord, for giving the gift of hospitality or the gift of marketing or the gift of business or caring for people, whatever that is, I want you to speak it out loud. And I want you to say, Lord, right now I give it back to you. I give this gift back to you. I'm going to honor your calling on my life. I give it back. I give back marketing. I give back caring for people. I give back my ability to build things and construct things. I, I give back my ability to serve people give it all to you right now and then when you feel comfortable I just want you to say those seven words I therefore the prisoner of the Lord because today you're saying Lord I'm I'm, I'm captive I'm held captive by you I've, I've given, given you my life it's not mine it's yours I'm a prisoner of the Lord.
Second, I just want you to take a moment and thank the Lord for the fivefold ministry gift. Would you just honor the Lord by saying, Lord, thank you for giving this gift to the church. Thank you for giving the gift of the apostle and the prophet and the evangelist and the pastor and the teacher. Give us more of it. We want to to see grace increase and multiply. We want to see blessing increase and multiply. Give us more of the fivefold ministry gift. Every one of the gifts in that one gift that you've given. We honor that gift. Teach us. Help us to be students. And then finally, I want to ask you to honor the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've never talked to the Holy Spirit as a person before. Would you do that right now? Would you just say, Holy Spirit, I want to talk to you right now and honor you in my life. I draw near to you. Please draw near to me. Go with me. Help me to be sensitive to you every place I go, not just on Sunday, but on Monday. I know you're living in my heart. You're the representative of the fullness of the Godhead in my life. God is in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And you, Holy Spirit, are right now, right here with me. And I honor you today. In Jesus' name. Pastor Markham, thank you for the invitation today. It's been a blessing to be with you. And with Revival Center, thank you.